Let's be careful, let's be careful, let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost could be forever. Let's be careful what we do to our land of flowing waters, to our land of fabled lakes comes an outfit known as Drillcon, which has never made mistakes. For the gas that lies below us, they intend to hydrofrack. They will push we don't know what down and stick us with what comes back. Let's be careful, let's be careful, let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost couldn't be forever, let's be careful. My name is Peter Campbell, and I'm a member of the Committee of the Before we begin, I would like to thank the following for their efforts toward creating this forum. And as I mention your name, if you choose, please stand up. Okay. Joe Hoff, Steve Kaufman, Jack Ossent, Marianne Bergoni, who did the art, was the artist who worked for our, did the flyer for us. Llewellyn and Laurel Lafford, whose B&B is being used by our guests this evening, Future Farmers of America, I'm Martha and Lou Gridley, Wesley Lickham from the Farm Bureau, co-sponsors CPNY and uh, Coalition to Protect New York and CUCA Citizens Against Hydrofracking, CUCA Lake Association, the Media Help, WYLF, the school districts for use of the facilities, all businesses who helped us advertise, the clerks at the local township for passing information on to the local officials, the panel members, and any C committee to preserve the Finger Lakes members I did not mention. Thank you. The committee to preserve the Finger Lakes is a little over two years old, and we are committed to preserving the natural beauty and the purity of water in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. Its scenic lakes and majestic landscape make the region worth preserving for future generations. We promote preservation by objectively identifying, informing, and educating the general public, officials, and administrators on environmental threats. In support of our commitment, the focus of this evening's forum will be on the promise and reality of hydrofracking and agriculture. Here are some of the national state promises as far as hydrofracking is concerned. Increase U.S. natural gas supply, natural gas claimed cleaner than other fossil fuels, transition to renewable energy, money for gas companies and investors, tax revenues, drilling is safe for the health, safety, and welfare of our communities. That's the national and state promises. The local promises, financial benefits to large rural landowners, increase in local employment, bar restaurant owners, increase in business, retail increase in business, hotels and motels increase in business, and again, drilling is safe for the health, safety, and welfare of our communities. Steve Kaufman will begin, and he will briefly address the issues, what the gas companies tell us, what the gas companies tell investors, what the gas companies promise, and what the gas companies do. We will have a question and answer session after all the speakers have completed their presentations. So in order to expedite this, this, this forum, we'd really like you to avoid questions while the speakers are speaking and in between each of them. They, all those questions can be answered uh, after they speak. We ask you to be polite and respectful during the talks and question and answer period. Please consider contributions if you have not done so. We are a volunteer organi organization funded exclusively by contributions. Anybody who has a cell phone, if you would please turn it off, we'd appreciate it. Let us begin. I would like to introduce Klaus Martins, who runs one of the largest organic farms in the state of New York. Klaus will mo modify the pres pres presentations. Thank you for coming. <coughs> Klaus. It's official. I'm getting old. I can't see without these things right now. But, uh, Steve Kaufman doesn't need too much introduction. Uh, he's a local author. He's lived here for a long time. 
Uh, he's been a friend, and I think uh, whenever the community has an issue, Steve's in the middle of it. Uh, I've got a personal question for Steve, and that's when gas wells have been drilled in this area in the past, um, we see a little spot, usually a tank and a casing, and not a lot of disruption. And I remember a well being drilled on my mother's farm 30 years ago. Again, they made a mess, but the footprint wasn't all that big. What we're hearing about now is huge pads that cover acres instead of just little spots. And I, Steve, are you ready to come up? Uh, if you could explain to us, what is it we're talking about? Is this, is this the same fracking that they did 30 years ago? And if it's not, you know, what's changed? What are we, why are we all of a sudden discussing an issue that we didn't have before? All right, yeah, thanks, Klaus. Um, Uh, I can't read this from where I am, but this is from the, uh, the DEC, from uh, their DGEIS study. So these are not figures that I made up or that the, the industry uh, wanted to tell us or anything else. It was from their, their own studies and their own predictions. So uh, uh, this gives us a pretty good idea. Let me say that uh, uh, since 1972, I've lived on what uh, what used to be a farm. Uh, we've had a couple of animals and a wonderful garden and a wonderful life there, but I'm not a farmer. But uh, out near Six Corners, south of Dundee, and uh, we have gas wells all around us. And uh, when I first heard about this, I wasn't very concerned. There was an occasional flaring and a you know, boom or something, but it was not no, no big concern to me then. And... Uh, but in, in, after three years of studying this, I realized that uh, this isn't uh, the old kind of gas well, the kind of gas well where you just go and it's in a pool down there, you put a pipe down, you suck up the gas, and you, you know you use it. Uh, the Marcella Shale is, is something different. Uh, they've known about it for a long time. And what's essentially different is that the gas is locked into a very tight shale, and it's inside the shale. So the only way to get at the gas is to blow it apart, and that's what hydrofracking basically means. And uh, while you may be told, uh, and certainly will be told by industry, oh, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we've 60 years, we've been doing it for 70 years, you know. Uh, that's not exactly true. It's true that they have used water to break open rock for that long, but this is a completely different technique that was started in Texas in 1992, and it took them about 10 years before they got it up to speed. So it's a relatively new technology, about 10 years old. And what's really different about it is the amount of water that they use. They, they use per well an average of two to five million gallons of fresh water. Uh, they use a half of 1% of certain chemicals. Each one uh, serves a specific purpose. Uh, a lot of sand, once they blow it apart under incredibly high 15,000 uh, pounds per square inch pressure to uh, blow apart this shale. And then once they get these cracks open, they have to hold it open. So they put down a lot of sand. And then they have problems with microbes and problems with rust, so rust inhibitors and acids. And anyway, each one of the chemicals they put down serves them a very important purpose. But unfortunately, about uh, a great majority of them, 70 some percent, are toxic. Uh, some of them carcinogen, some of them mutagenic, uh, and so forth. So then the, the problem is that uh, they have to suck up all of the water so that the gas will flow after that. So because you put in so much water, you know, two to five million gallons per well, uh, and now what used to be clean water is toxic with not only uh, the additives that they w were put into it, but also with, from underneath, uh, a lot of uh, uh, radiation, uh, radium that is in Marcella shale, heavy metals, uh, uh, mercury, uh, barium, things like that. So that what the product that comes out is very difficult to deal with. And in fact, that is one of the hugest problems. So they put it in a big pit. Well, that, that's one, one difference. The other difference is you're talking about scale. The scale of this is so not only in terms of because you're using so much water, you have to bring in, to bring in five million gallons of water per each well, you're talking about huge convoys full of trucks. And that's, that's what we've got up here. If you look down here at the heavy truck traffic per, 
per pad. A pad is uh, one uh, of about five, uh, if you include the, the waste pit, and maybe as much as 10 acres. And you, your constant heavy industrial traffic that's going to and from that pad. And the pad itself uh, has what's called, they use what's called horizontal drilling. So there, there's one major well and then they go out horizontally from that and they may have eight different wells fed from that. But each one has to be fracked individually. So these figures are for, for each, each well that comes up there, two to five million gallons with all of these trucks. And uh, if you're talking about eight say uh, uh, wells per pad, you multiply that times eight. And then if they've got a well that's going, you know, it's a good producing well, but it slows down, they come back and refrack it. And they may refrack it two or three times. So then they all come back in and they do it again. So I think you can begin to imagine that what you're really talking about here is turning our land into an industrialized zone. That's, that's, that's what it looks like, and that's where the problem really comes, and the fact that you end up with these enormous amounts of wastewater and nobody knows what to do with it. Uh, I'm sure uh, other members of our panel will talk about that later. So I just wanted to give you some view, for those of you who aren't familiar with this subject, about why uh, this is um, uh, so concerning to so many people. Uh, because we imagine turning our area into something very different from what it is. I, I know my wife and I took a, a trip from uh, New Orleans to Port Arthur, Texas a couple years ago, uh, about 150 miles, and we thought, oh, some Cajun music, we'll watch the sunset over the Gulf of Mexico, you know, some little motels, a little bar here and there. Well, what we, what we found well, there is not a motel, there's not a restaurant, there's not a beach on that 150 mile stretch. There's nothing but gas and oil and pipes and piles and rigs and junk. Now, it's true that if you go north of that, you can get back into sanctuaries of the wonderful birds and great fishing and Cajun culture, but where they are, there's nothing else. And it, 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 it got my attention, this was a couple of years ago, and it, it made me double my efforts to say, I want people to realize that isn't what we want here. So anyway, I hope you'll take a good look at this. Uh, um, it gives you some idea of uh, what, what it looks like. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Richard Gilbert, retired from Rochester. I bet since retirement you haven't slowed down much, have you? No. <laughs> but uh, he's president of Interpath, Interfaith Impact of New York. Um, I had a chance to talk with uh, Reverend Gilbert. He's got a farm background. His grandfather had a farm in Honey Oy. Of course, everybody who farms loves to say they have Honey Oy soil. And uh, he tells me that they used to have cows and horses. And He's a step up on me, because I've never driven a team of horses. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. I think one of the last times I was in Penyan, I was playing basketball for Candago Academy. So I hope you won't hold that against me. And baseball as well, I think. But it's nice to be back in, in the southern Finger Lakes. I myself have a cottage on Seneca Lake the Northern Finger Lakes, so I have an interest in this from a personal point of view as well. The topic of my talk is eco-justice and earth care. I present a religious perspective. Some of us are perhaps old enough to remember the, the prophetic words of the comedic songwriter Tom Lair. Just two things of which you must beware. Don't drink the water and don't breathe the air. Fifty years ago, this Harvard mathematics professor was on to something. What human beings do to the earth comes back to haunt them. In the time of Aristotle, a philosopher who lived 2,500 years ago, economics was a subsidiary of ethics. Ethics was the big deal. Now economics, read money, seems to dominate everything everywhere. We sometimes forget that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. The field of integrating our interest in the ecology of the earth and the ethics of justice, we of the religious community call eco-justice. 
In an essay by the scientist Lynn White, written for the first Earth Day in 1970, he blamed the Bible for Western civilization's environmental sins. He quoted from Genesis 1, 28, Revised Standard Version. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. In this creation myth, God had given humanity some marching orders. Subsequently, we felt free to treat the earth as a mine, to exploit it for purely human purposes. The result was almost unrestrained ecological arrogance. Now, the contemporary poet, Wendell Berry, who's also a farmer, points out there is another translation of that section of Genesis. In the earlier King James Version of the Bible, we read this in the same part of Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. We are to replenish the earth to be good stewards. So the earth then is not a mine which we will one day exhaust but a garden which will constantly replenish itself, providing we are responsible gardeners. Now, whether or not we agree with White, Lynn White, or Wendell Berry, I do know, however, that this distinction between the way we look at the earth is critical. It's an important distinction. How we view the earth as a mine or as a garden is not only a spiritual matter, but an ethical issue. So earth, for me, is both a mystery to be celebrated and a problem to be solved. Our eco-justice dilemma is illustrated by a classic Jack Benny comedy routine. Now, some of us are old enough to remember Jack Benny. Would you raise your hand if you remember Jack Benny? Oh, thank you. Good, good. I'm reassured. Benny poked fun at himself for being stingy. In one skit, he is confronted by a robber. Your money or your life? Benny is silent. Again, the mugger demands, your money or your life? Again, Benny is silent. For the last time, the mugger shouts, your money or your life? A brief silence, followed by Benny whining, I know, I know, I'm thinking it over. And that is where we find ourselves in the tension between economic development, money, and environmental preservation, life. Can we have both? Your money or your life? It is time to think it over. Our American ethos is to grow, 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 go faster, 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 and consume more, more, more. Our twin global crises, the economic and the environmental, are not the result of some accident or random chance, but of deliberate human arrangements. Economics, theoretically, is the allocation of scarcity. There's only so much to go around. But our assumptions are all geared toward abundance. There's plenty enough if we keep growing. So our slogans tell the tale, grow or die. More is better. Growth will trickle down. We can grow our way out of these problems. Our economic god is the gross domestic product, GDP, the total of goods and services that we produce. But one economist went so far as to write, I must confess to an instinctive conviction that what cannot be measured may not exist. What cannot be measured may not exist for the economist. For faith, it is quite the opposite. We are concerned especially about what cannot be measured. GDP does not tell us how rapidly we are depleting our natural resources, or how badly we are polluting our environment, or how unevenly we are distributing our resources, or it certainly does not tell us how happy we are. In fact, GDP includes cleaning up the effluence of our affluence, including all the investment 
in cleaning up the Gulf oil spill, mountaintop strip mining, or gas well drilling. It is this arrogance that leads us to our rush to drill, whether it be in the Gulf of Mexico or the Marcellus and Utica shale deposits of New York State. The American economic ethos partakes several of the seven deadly sins, just a few of them, pride, covetousness, greed, envy, and gluttony, all of which threaten to leave our descendants a tragic legacy. It is they who must clean up our waste, who must find the natural resources to replace those we deplete, who must provide water in areas already desperately dry, or on the other hand, terribly polluted. As one wit said, we are living beyond our means, and the Earth Bank is not federally funded, federally insured. We are the most gluttonous and profligate people in history. Accounting for some 5% of the world's population, we consume some 30% of its natural resources and produce 23% of its CO2, 18 tons per person per year. We consume twice as much energy as Europeans do for the same standard of living, and I can attest to that because I've lived in Europe for a number of months and know how conservation-minded they really are. I can detail that if you're interested. We are addicted to short-term profits. In the words of the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, we are literally consuming the planet. In short, we are energy hogs. Ecologist Kenneth Boulding's metaphor compares and contrasts a cowboy economy with an astronaut economy. The cowboy of the plane sees resources as infinite and has no need to conserve or recycle. The astronaut in a small capsule lives with finite resources which must be recycled for survival. For the cowboy, boundaries are un-American. For the astronaut, they are life parameters. Which brings us to hydrofracking. Drilling gas for Pennsylvania, and last Sunday, we had some people who work in Pennsylvania tell us from the ground up what it's like living with hydrofracking. And of course now, New York's southern tier and other portions of the northeast are ripe for drilling. Today's hot button issue. And while many are encouraged by the voluminous natural gas resources embedded in the Marcellus and Utica shale deposits, the environmental implications may be dire. In fracking, the use of large volumes of water to extract the gas and the potential pollution and the runoff into our lakes and rivers. We read of politicians and others eager for new jobs, and surely we need them. And we read of water taps catching fire, and we know economic development and our environmental needs are often in conflict. So I suggest our faith traditions, and I don't know how many of you are from a religious community, but I think they all help us think through this ethical issue. First, religion provides us a holistic perspective over space and time. The big picture, what we might call a God's eye view of the world. We must look at all the implications of the hydrofracking process, not only the immediate drilling, but also the total potential environmental impact. Well, natural gas is a relatively clean burning fuel, and I had some scientists debate that Sunday afternoon. We need to account for the energy consumed in drilling, building pads, truck traffic, air, water, and sound pollution road and bridge repairs, decline in farming and tourism, and reduce property values. A faith perspective means that long-term stewardship trumps instant gratification. The health of the environment becomes more important than immediate profit. Faith counteracts the moral myopia of this instant, that we've got to have all of it and have it now, because it's right there in front of us. We can feel the money. We can touch the money. We need to be alert to what might become a tipping point beyond which we are unable to recover from our abuse of the earth. We don't know where or even if it is, but we must be wary. 
environmentally, the sword of Damocles may well be hanging over our heads. We just don't know, so we have to err on the side of caution. Well, second, religion provides us with humility. We know we are but fragments of the stars, part of an interdependent web of all existence. Our faith reminds us to be grateful for the bounty of Earth. With all our technology, as we have subdued the Earth, we have, I think, sometimes lost sense of our utter and total dependence upon it. We know we are utterly dependent on the Earth, our one and only home. So we need to learn to live within our limits and the limits of our planetary home. Which reminds me, a friend of mine with whom I worked at a church camp in the Adirondacks once joked that he knew his limits, but he always got drunk before he reached them. We are beginning to know the limits of the earth, but we are in danger of getting drunk and exceeding them before we sober up. Mother Nature doesn't do bailouts. There is no 12-step program she provides. Third, religious enables us to grow spiritually and ethically. Our desire as a nation to be independent of foreign sources of energy requires a modification of our wasteful and extravagant lifestyles. How many resources must we extract and how much pollution can we tolerate for the good life, which is, after all, perhaps our purpose here on Earth? I believe that the good life will require of us to become born-again pantheists in total love with the Earth, with Mother Nature. The planet is our host. We must be worthy and responsible guests. Our lifestyles, both personal and social, must become greener. greener. Will our continued reliance on fossil fuels simply delay our adoption of renewable energy resources, which we know we ultimately will need to survive because these other natural resources can be depleted. Fourth, as people of the book, Jewish, Christian, and humanist, we have been trained in, I'm going to give you a fancy word now, we've been trained in a hermeneutic of suspicion. Fancy way of saying that we've learned to be a little bit skeptical of things. And all claims must be greeted with a degree of skepticism, especially claims of those who stand to profit from what is about to happen, or they would like to have happen. According to some, regulation is one of the great evils of our time. But with freedom goes responsibility. In our eagerness to mine the earth, we may become overly zealous to extract that which Mother Nature has taken millions of years to produce, and we extract and use it in virtually the blink of an eye. We who have been through Love Canal in New York State and the BP Gulf of Mexico oil spill are rightly skeptical of energy company claims. We have privatized profits and socialized risks. Our inspector, one inspector with the overwhelmed Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection exclaimed, we simply can't keep up, there's just too much waste. If we're too hard on them, the companies might just stop reporting their mistakes. And John Hanger, who recently left the same department as secretary, acknowledged, there are business pressures on companies to cut corners. It's cheaper to dump wastewater than to treat it. And that great liberal, Ronald Reagan, once said, trust, but verify. And so finally, to be good stewards of the earth will require us to become prophets, not in predicting the future, but in speaking truth to power. Shaping that vision, shaping that vision of our beloved community. Let justice flow down like unpolluted waters, as was the title of our Sunday program. It will require the kind of social action that looks at the systemic causes of our problems. We will challenge economic dogma, our obsession with speed, growth, and a market economy whose profit motive too often ignores environmental collateral damage. We can live more lightly on the planet. And for proof, I cite another liberal rag 
the Wall Street Journal. An article pointed out we can save as much as 75% of our electricity, but may never do so because business requires payback in less than three years. We need what the psychologist William James called a moral equivalent to war, a transcendent goal which requires sacrifice that takes the psychological place of war with its call to commitment and equal sacrifice. As a Boy Scout, which I was for a good many years, I was taught to leave my campsite in as good or better condition than I found it. All my trash was to be disposed of properly. The campfire had to be safely extinguished. Some extra kindling wood should be left for the next camper. I wonder if this same ethic might not be applied to human beings inhabiting planet Earth. So finally, in the words of E.F. Schumacher, of small is beautiful fame, who rejoiced in being called a crank. I don't mind at all. A crank is a low cost, low capital tool. It can be used on a small scale. It is nonviolent. And it makes revolutions. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is our longtime friend and neighbor, uh, Art Hunt. He operates with his family, Hunt Country Vineyards, and we know that there's a future in your farm because there's two more generations after you, which a lot of farmers would like to have. Uh, I know talking with Art, uh, you've had the same thing of people coming up to your door and wanting to give you lots of money. And I guess my initial reaction is most of the people who contact me and want to give me lots of money are from Nigeria. but. Thank you, Klaus. Um, yeah, I get the Nigerian calls, too. Um, is there any chance you can get that up? OK, great. I have just, just a few photographs to show you. Um, as Klaus mentioned, we've been on the farm for quite a few generations. Um, oh, great. OK. And my wife and I, Joyce and I, are the fifth generation. Our, our children are the sixth generation. And uh, I just want to show you a little bit of the history. You see the little black, dark brown barn in the foreground. That was built by the first generation in, in the early 1800s. It's at the very south end of our farm. And they built a log cabin and later a frame house. If you look in the background on the right side, there's a, a really nice farm there. That was built by the second generation of Hunts on Stever Hill Road now owned by the Tones family, who are some of the best farmers in the area. And our farm, where we live, is at the north end of this, this farm, about a mile to the north. And we now, as of the first of uh, the year, New Year's Day, we have the seventh generation uh, from John, Jonathan and Caroline. And this is William Boutard Hunt. Notice his, notice his big hands. Hopefully, he'll be a farmer someday. He had his first gator ride today out to the woods. While this picture is up, this is a picture by Steve Knapp, one of his many beautiful pictures of the area. I want to just mention that many of us have had gas leases in the past, and uh, many of us still do. Up until now, gas drilling was fairly safe, and I'll probably be repeating some of Steve's comments, uh, but I think they bear repeating. Um, and the disruptions were worth the inconvenience since we knew they were temporary and had few long-term detrimental effects on our land. Besides, if they struck gas, we would eventually receive some royalties, which would help with the bills and make it easier to stay in farming. We also knew that the money was temporary and the well would eventually run dry and it would have to be capped and done with. Rarely were there problems with ruined water wells or poisoned land. There was only a small amount of water used in the drilling operation then. The most common problem was a large amount of salt in the tailings and the brine that was recovered. Even if the brine ran on the ground, 
eventually it was washed away by the rain. Usually the brine and the tailings were trucked away to become someone else's problem. When the well ran out of gas, we went back to the way we were. And few people have problems with this type of gas extraction even today. As most of us have realized, often in hindsight, many of the gas company's agents, called landmen, are not to be trusted. When they've come around in the last few years to renew our leases or sign up new acreage, they have not mentioned what they envisioned for their new method of drilling in the future. And they didn't mention it's nothing like the drilling done in the past. For example, as Klaus mentioned, instead of one or two acres of land bulldozed for the well pad, it's now six to, 12, uh, six to 10 acres leveled. Instead of one vertical well drilled per well pad, now there are four to 12 wells drilled horizontally from a single vertical well. Instead of a handful of truckloads of water per well, there are now as many as 10,000 or more truckloads of water, chemicals and sand, and equipment per well pad. The water is mixed with sand and toxic chemicals. This mixture is pumped down the well under extreme pressure to fracture and pulverize the shale layers. And as much as half of this poison mixture is forced back out of the, pressure, out of the ground by the pressure of the gas released from the shale. It now contains high levels of salts, heavy metals, and pulverized, often radioactive, shale mud. There's currently no practical large-scale way to completely decontaminate this produced water. However, they are building a smaller facility in Pennsylvania that potentially will be able to treat up to one million gallons a day. And so now, unfortunately, thousands of additional truckloads are, are currently needed to haul it somewhere else. But since the gas companies are now exempt from the Federal Clean Water Act, they have tried, they have tried putting it through municipal water treatment plants, but it kills all the bacteria in the plants. So they've dumped it in rivers and they've dumped it on the ground. And uh, look at this next photograph, please. Actually, this next photograph is a footprint of our farm. Oh, I have the button here. Now this is the footprint of an intensely hydrofracking operation out in Wyoming. It was done in, in the, about nine, uh, 2005, 2006. Now you notice that for thousands of square of, of acres, it's pretty much intensely hydrofracked with roads and pipelines, well pads, uh, compressor areas, filtration areas, uh, and I don't even know what some of those buildings are for. But if you notice carefully, around each, each well, I don't think this has, yeah, it does have a beeper, doesn't it? Is there a, uh, uh, it doesn't work. Anyway, you see the brown areas around most of the wells, sort of an irregular shaped brown uh, low and lying area. I don't know for sure, but as I said, they didn't have to take away the, the, the produced water, as it's called. So I think I've been told that a lot of it goes on the ground and some of it evaporates it and some of it goes into the ground. And what really makes me think this is, a, this is happening is because I've read that the Wyoming farmers have been complaining for several years that the water that they, come out, they take out of the ground for the cows is poison and they're losing a lot of cows. Finally, just the last couple of months, they finally got the Wyoming Department of Environmental Protection to come and investigate. But uh, I don't know that that's what they did with it, but they have no, else, no place else to put it. And it's certainly, uh, no penalties for doing that. We'll move back on to another one. So, which footprint do we want? Let me see where was I. Okay, page three. If we ask the industry people about this new process, they say they've been doing hydrofracking in New York State for over 40 years. This is a very misleading statement. They have been pressurizing some vertical wells using relatively small amounts of water, sometimes mixed with sand, over the past 40 years. They have not done high volume, slick water, horizontal hydrofracking using millions of gallons of water per well mixed with chemicals and sand. This was first used, according to the gas industry, starting about 1999. 
And for, unfortunately, our st state legislative representatives and some of our congressmen have been fed this false information and they fiercely repeat it. They don't even acknowledge the difference when we explain it to them. I wonder why. Luckily, some of the DEC people understand the difference. In 2005, Vice President Dick Cheney, who stepped down from CEO of Halliburton to become Vice President, successfully lobbied Congress along with the uh, petroleum industry lobbyists, and they got Congress to pass a law exempting the gas, oil, and coal industries from the Clean Water Act. Now every other industry, including all of us, must abide by the act. Understand that Halliburton, who created, who created this hydrofracking technique, sells the secret formula chemicals and also provides the crew to the crews to do the hydrofracking operations. Remember that they have no way of safely disposing of the millions of gallons of highly toxic liquids they create with each well. And this exemption from the Clean Water Act gave them a way to dump their toxic waste anywhere they want since now they are exempt from, the, from prosecution by law. This is why they can frack with impunity. Some of you may have decided not to renew your gas lease and are relieved that you won't be drilled upon. And I, I applaud you for that. It's a great step. However, in New York State, we are bound by the unitization rule. This means that the gas companies can determine a 640-acre area that they, that they define as a unit. They only have to sign up 60% of that land in the unit, and then they can draw the boundaries lines to suit themselves. A gas company can still drill under your property from your neighbor's leased land and possibly destroy your clean water, and they can locate the rig as close as 100 feet from your house if your house is near your property line, like mine is. Often landmen tell the landowners that they are the only one in the unit who has not signed up a lease. Now, of course, it's an inducement to get them to sign, and it's often completely false. But remember this, even if you do sign a lease and then change your mind, you can cancel the lease if you do it within three days and return any money they gave you at signing. Unlike before of hydrofracking, once they decide to drill in Mar into the Marcellus shale on your farm, your farm is entirely under their control. It becomes an industrial site. According to DEC records, over the years, a significant number of gas wells have eventually contaminated local, local water wells, aquifers, or streams. But hydrofracking increases these odds, or the drilling process that is undertaken to create hydrofracking increases these odds. If our goal is to continue to farm or to live in this beautiful unspoiled region where we take clean water and air and fertile land as our right, we need to refuse to lease our lands to these gas companies until they can develop new methods that are safe or to go back to older methods that were safe and do not destroy our way of life and our land. We need to take this position if we want our children and grandchildren to be able to live here and grow healthy food for a hungry planet. I've read a couple of books recently about the coming shortage of fresh water. Most of the farming in the western U.S. is irrigated, and those areas are starting to run out of water. Within a generation or less, most of that production will have to be grown somewhere else. Here in the Finger Lakes, we have some of the cleanest, most abundant fresh water in the world. We have a temperate climate and fertile soils. This region is destined to once again become the bread basket of the Northeast. Farmers will soon be able to make a good living growing food again. We cannot afford to lose another acre of farmland here to gas wells or to developers. Now I know that the official policy of Farm Bureau has been pro-drilling. That policy was established before widespread information was known about what really happens to your farm with hydrofracking. I believe we can change this grassroots policy if we simply show up at the local policy execution meetings each year and vote. Believe me, I know how difficult it is at times to make ends meet on a farm and I have many friends who have had to sell their farms. But we are now reaching a time in the world's history when the world can no longer feed itself. Recently, grain and food prices 
around the world have been rising dramatically. Unusual weather events have disrupt disrupted growing cycles, not to mention tsunamis. We see the beginnings of a new food movement already. Yates County has the largest percentage of organically farmed acreage of any county in the country and among the most diverse types of crops. Thank you, Klaus and Mary Howell. People now want to know where their food comes from, and the buy local trend is growing. Another consideration about whether to lease is the policy of some banks not to loan to property with gas leases on them. In Pennsylvania, many banks are now curtailing new loans. In fact, Chase Bank and Bank of America, two of the largest in the country, and many of the regional banks have already made this policy. And I believe in the southern tier, there are some banks that are now no longer loaning to lands that have gas leases on them. Others, other banks I've talked to in New York do not currently have any restrictions, but they are telling me that they are discussing the situation as they contemplate the risks. Uh, please don't consider taking the risk of destroying forever your farm and possibly even the land of your neighbors for a chance of quick cash. A few, a few years from now, the gas companies will move on, leaving you and the ruined land behind. The money will be gone, and so will your children's future. Look at the young people in the room tonight, our future farmers. Are there some FFA members here? Stand up. I think we need to give you a little applause. You are, you are our future. The Native Americans have a saying, whatever decisions we make today, they should always have in view the seven unborn generations who fa whose faces are yet beneath the surface of the ground. That's called the Haudenosaunee Great Law of Peace. When I was young, my grandfather was alive. He was the third generation. Our grandson is the seventh. It's not such a long time. Please keep this in mind as we, we each way the possibility of some short-term casts against the possible long-term loss of value and the loss and the use of our land forever. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Art. Our next speaker is Alan Harrison. We worked with you when you were at Cornell, and Alan retired a few years ago, and I guess retirement is a joke. She hasn't slowed down all that much. <laughs> and we really have to appreciate the effort you made to get here. I understand you weren't feeling very well. Right. Thank you. So I am an environmental scientist uh, trained in geology. And about three years ago, my husband and I signed a gas lease. And about two years ago, I realized that it wasn't old-fashioned kind of gas and was totally horrified. I didn't sleep for about three days, felt ill, and realized that if I had signed, I know that there are a lot of people who signed and signed without realizing what the implications are and were. Um, I started an organization, which when the slides come up, you'll see a logo for it, called Fleeced, and we um, are a group of people who signed and realized that it was a, a drastic mistake. Um, if there, are there some of you out there who have gas leases and have concerns about it? It's a very hard thing to admit, uh, I know I felt terribly ashamed. And I actually ended up writing an op-ed piece for the local paper because I sort of felt like I had to come out and tell people how I felt about it at this point. Um, and you know, and why did I sign? There was some money, not a great deal of money. We certainly got the high pressure that Art was talking about where your neighbors have all signed, you're gonna, we're gonna drill under your land anyway, you might as well get some money for it. And also, we bought the false line. I mean, we used 
a lot of energy. I sort of felt we had a responsibility to generate some energy um, and thought local was good. And so for those reasons we signed and it was a drastic mistake. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out there for Fleeced. If you're interested, there's a website at fleeced.org and we would welcome you and or your neighbors if you know people who have signed. So why were we so horrified? Questions that we didn't ask or didn't think about and that anybody who's thinking of signing a lease should ask is, is it limited, is the lease limited to a certain formation? We talk about the Marcellus, that's the one that everybody's talking about now. But there are other layers below the Marcellus that most leases would allow the companies to drill. And once they start activity on the area in which your land is included, they can keep going. Your lease does not terminate as long as there's activity. So once they've drilled the Marcellus, they'll come back and they'll drill the Utica. And it makes good sense because they'll already have the pipelines, they'll already have the road infrastructure, already have the well pads. So uh, apparently in Texas, people are smarter uh, or more experienced with this. And they will only sign for a specific formation. One of the things I just heard, which was fascinating, is you know my lease here, I don't know, it's seven pages, something like that. DEC has leased some land. It's a 90-page lease. They're being a lot more careful. Uh, when we went to the web's DEC website back when we were thinking of signing, there was very little information. Um, okay, I can't read this from here. Okay, so in addition to drilling, um, gas requires an infrastructure that can include um, a compression station. Basically, they've got to uh, compress the gas so that it'll flow through a pipeline. Those are noisy and polluting. And one of the things the uh, previous speaker mentioned was, you know, is gas a green alternative? Well, the reality is a lot of gas leaks. It's flared in the beginning, it leaks when it's being transmitted, and what it's leaking is methane, which is a very strong greenhouse gas. So uh, recently a, a Cornell professor who's expert in this area has put together a paper that basically says shale gas is basically as bad as coal when it comes to greenhouse gases, and neither of them is good. We've got to get to renewables. And when we have gas as cheap as it is and cheap as it will be, we're not going to get to renewables. Pipelines are a part of the whole, you know, you've got to transmit the gas. So anytime there's a well, there's going to be a pipeline leading out of that well. And one of the concerns is, in part, fragmentation of habitat. You're chopping it all up, and that's a natural concern. Um, how long is the duration? I mentioned that basically it's pretty much forever if they start doing anything. It's because they can hold it open as long as they've sort of spent any money and it's very ill-defined what they have to do. Somebody said it may be as little as, you know, putting in a gravel, gravel driveway and that'll hold it. You think you have a five-year lease? Almost all of the leases, the standard leases, are five years, but then they have a five-year right to renew without you having to say anything. And so then within that 10-year period, if they do anything on that spacing unit, the area in which your land is part of, you're held. Um, what does this one say? Ah, mortgages. So it was a mention about mortgages, mention about insurance. Um, my homeowner's insurance does not cover industrial activity. This is an industrial activity. So those are questions you need to ask if you're thinking and be worried about. Property values is quite a mixed bag. Um, we've heard of places in Broome County where speculators are coming in and buying up land because they think the gas is going to be worth so much. So in those cases, some property values have escalated. And then I hear of a number of other cases where people don't want to live on or near a gas well. What does this one say? 
Yeah, this one is catching all of the tax assessors completely confused. They have no idea what to do about it. Um, partly because they don't know what's happening to property values, but partly also because the gas as a resource is taxable property. So this is, this is a wild card. I don't think anybody at this point knows what's going to happen with taxes. This is an interesting one, and that is, for the most part, the leases don't specify how many acres they can disturb, where on the land they can do it. Um, if one is going to lease, one certainly should make that very clear. Anything they tell you verbally has no, is not enforceable. It must be in writing on the lease. Uh, it's advised that you get the uh, landman to sign every page because one of the things we found out, we were hoping we might be able to sue to get out of our leases because we felt that we were misled. They left us with brochures that described good old fashioned drilling and what we found out was they're not allowed to lie to you, but they don't have to tell you the truth. So in a residential real estate transaction, they must disclose. You know, if you have a radon test and it shows you have high radon and you're trying to sell your house, you must disclose that. Here, there is no disclosure requirement, none. And here, what is your recourse if they violate? There's a farmer with a good old fashioned well who's been having a horrible time in our, in uh, Tioga County. And basically, she has to pay major lawyer's fees. And if you read some of the fine print, sometimes it says you have to pay the lawyer's fees for the gas company, if you question it. So enforcement is an issue. What does that one say? Oh, will there be wastewater ponds? So out west, uh, it's very dry. And wastewater ponds are actually the way they get rid of the fluids that come back, the contaminated waters. Here in the Northeast, uh, it's wetter than that, and you can't dis it, it won't evaporate. But DEC, in the previous draft, who knows what will come out in the future, was allowing wastewater ponds for temporary storage. So these ponds are dangerous. Um, they will be volatilizing, chemicals will be coming off into the air from them, and access to them is a, a real issue. So we've all heard, I think most of us have heard about some of the environmental problems. Well water contamination, contamination of streams. Uh, one of the things, it's so funny, I, I was a work for the environmental agency in Connecticut a number of years ago doing groundwater pollution work and one set of wells was contaminated with road salt. People, uh, highway departments used to just store salt in piles and I thought, oh salt, that's not a big deal. What I found out was salt is one of the hardest pollutants to deal with. Uh, it wrecks, you know, your plumbing and stuff in your house and it's not something you want to drink in high concentrations and it's really hard to remove. Well, the shale uh, is very salty. It was deposited in a shallow sea 300 million years ago. So one of the worst problems that is that the water that comes back up is very salty. And that's actually what has really uh, screwed up a bunch of rivers in Pennsylvania and is something that a, a sewage treatment plant, if you were to take this waste fracking fluid and put it through a sewage treatment plant, the salt goes right through. It doesn't, the, the sewage treatment plants don't treat for that. So interestingly, that's a real problem. Um, spills and leaks. Basically, in doing this stuff, all those trucks are coming, they're bringing various chemicals, they have uh, oil that is lubricating this and that. Spills and leaks are a serious problem. Um, and you can expect, I think, I. I think it was an industry person who said, you know, what are you worrying about? It's only a 0.3% failure rate, problem rate. Well, they're talking in Tompkins County about 4,000 wells. 0.3%, I think my math was right, gets me to 12 contamination incidents. That's a lot. And they're spread where we live. We're used to zoning where 
industrial development takes place in certain areas and we don't expect those to be pristine. But now we're talking about industrial development that's just spread across the landscape. It's where we live, it's where we farm. And that's a real problem. Uh, air pollution issues, basically compressor stations are bad, all that truck traffic uh, air pollution issues, and explosions uh, happen because of some of this. One of the things that's not getting as much press as I think it needs to is the community impacts. I was down in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, where they are drilling, and they've just begun drilling there. They have not penetrated uh, nearly as many wells as they will. And what happens is rents skyrocket because many of the workers are itinerant. They come from Texas and Oklahoma. And in fact, the person who was speaking with us, who was a county person, said there's now 10% of their jail population is from Texas and Oklahoma. Um, so these people come in, they have a lot of money, they're paid really well, and rents triple, quadruple. So what that means then is your kids can't afford to stay here. They can't pay the rent. Grandma can't afford her rent. And what was just unbelievably heartbreaking is homelessness has more than doubled in Bradford. And kids are being put in foster care because their parents cannot house them. That to me is just a tragic story. And I don't know how you're ever gonna fix that. I, you, know, you may get a better environmental way of drilling and maybe you can recycle some of the water, but basically the only way you get the gas is by drilling, 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 because you can only fracture the rock a certain distance. And so you have to basically put in a huge number of wells, which means you need a lot of people, which means you're gonna see this disruption Crime has been documented to increase a great deal. Again, these itinerant young men are bored. They work 12-hour days. There's a lot of drinking and drugs. Um, there was a paper indicating increased sex crimes, but just all kinds of crimes. Uh, small communities having to hire police. Bradford basically saying they had to hire police now. And nobody's paying, paying for that except the taxpayers. Um, the cost of living goes up. Existing businesses have trouble because truck drivers now are working for the gas company because they're getting paid more. I think there was some article in the paper about milk trucks, having trouble getting milk trucks. I was trying to get some stone delivered to my house and the guy said, I don't know when I'm gonna be able to get it there or my truckers are gone. The Bradford County people were saying their secretaries have gone over there. They are having trouble recruiting workers because rents are so high and because gas companies pay well. Uh, no hotel space. One of the stories told in Bradford was they used to have an annual family reunion. They couldn't get any hotel space. It was all taken. When grandma wants to come to go to the high school graduation, you better have room in your house. And then in general, just the loss of community. Very briefly, a couple of myths that are told that I want to dispel. One is that it's a local energy source. Well, yeah, it's gotten locally. But right now, China, Norway, France, um, India, they own significant shares in these energy companies. And if you think it's gonna stay here, don't be silly. It's gonna go wherever there's money to be made, the most money. They're building facilities, liquid natural gas facilities, which basically compress the gas, make it a liquid, and then ship it overseas. Um, we also uh, say it will boost local employment. Most of the employees are from out of state, and many locals are gonna have trouble finding local employees. And the last is, I mentioned that it's a greener fuel. It's not. It's still a fossil fuel. It's still producing greenhouse gases. And if we keep uh, gas cheap, who's gonna pay for other sources? Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. Our next speaker is Terry Greenwood. Uh, Terry has beef cattle and farms in Washington County, Pennsylvania. We were just talking about uh, collecting old farm malls and restoring them. I guess we both saw one go by that we should have gotten recently. Uh, 
Uh, mine is the effects on gas wells on your property. I have a farm, 60 acres. I didn't sign a lease. The lease is from 1921. I have 60 acres. They, Dominion Gas come on my property in 2007 and said, we're going to drill some wells on your property. I said, go on the other 60 acres that's not being used because I need my property. They hounded me for about six months, roughly, and they kept coming back, coming back. And I said, I have water, I have cattle. I said, how are you going to protect me? They says, well, we'll protect you. So they sent me a letter and said, we will protect your waters. I said, okay. I didn't have a choice. They were going to eminent domain my property because the lease was a never-ending lease. So they come on the property in November 2007. Didn't tell me they was coming on, just cut the fence. Come on in, start building roads. So our property's half mile long. They built a road half mile long. They built a road a quarter mile long. Uh, when they got done building the roads, I had cattle out. Couldn't keep them in for about three or four months. Uh, in January 2008, they got one well drilled. Our well water went. So we didn't have no drinking water. And seven days later, they finally brought us some drinking water, which we're still using a water fountain, uh, drinking out of it. Now we're paying for it because they discontinued it. They can do what they want to because they're so big and who are you going to call? Nobody will listen to you. Then the second well they drilled on the top field, it was 280 feet from the pond where the cattle drank. They was drilling, all the water was running into the field. They was spilling it all into the field. So, we, in 2008, April, my cattle all started having calves. So I had 18 head of calf, cows. I had calves starting to die. I didn't know what was wrong, you know. I've been farming for 18 years on my own farm, and we used farms before in that. So, they kept dying, some lived, some died, in the end, Four of them was blind. Two of them was, had blue eyes. One had a cleft palate. Two had pure white eyes. So my oldest son says, let's fence the pond off because DEP and the gas company says, we didn't do nothing wrong, but I did call DEP, which is supposed to help you. And he says, there's nothing wrong with that water. They dump it in the fields in West Virginia. And I said this at an EPA meeting, and I'll stick to that. And I'll tell you who the DEP guy is because he never helped us. So we fenced the pond off. But I still lost 10 calves and I lost a, a two-year-old heifer. She died because they was drinking that pond. So whatever's in them chemicals, it killed my animals and I know it'll kill people later down the road. So anybody with gas leases or anything, it, I feel sorry for you. I hope you can get out of it. And you don't want them around here because I've never been up here before and I like all these waters up here. And that's pretty precious. I wish we had water like that down in Western Pennsylvania because Western Pennsylvania is losing all its waters because we didn't have city water. It's a mile and a half down the road. And it don't do me no good down there. So I've got a farm with 60 acres with a, a temporary water supply from a gas company. And th that's how they treat you. Yeah, they treat you dirty. When they come on your property, they say, we can do what we want to. Who are you going to call? You can't call your neighbors because they can't help you. You call Harrisburg. I called Harrisburg, called Farm Bureau, called everybody. They said, what do you want us to do? Nobody will stick up for you, so you've got to stick together and keep them away from here. You know, Western Pennsylvania is getting like Colorado, Texas, and every place else, so keep them out of here. You know, I don't know what it'll take, but keep them out of here. You know. so, I, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Our next speaker is Ron Gula, and I was talking with Ron. Uh, he's also raised beef cattle, and uh, you know a lot of young people here have been in 4-H. Ron sold some of his stock. They were registered Kianina, and I don't know how many of you know what Kianina cattle are. They're the, one of the oldest breeds in the world, and they're one of the biggest. A uh, full-size Kianina bull can reach as much as 4,000 pounds. That's a whole lot of bull. <laughs> Hey, 
and it's a whole lot of meat and a whole lot of hamburger. And don't make them mad. Uh, <clears throat> folks, uh, you know, listening to everyone speak, um, I'm, I'm Catholic, and I went to my church over a year ago, and I talked to the priests about it. Actually, it was two years ago. And last summer, I had the opportunity to go to our bishop in Pittsburgh, uh, Bishop Zubik. And I told him, this is about peace, justice, and the integrity of God's creation. And these guys are destroying it. I used to work in the oil and gas industry. I'm not an expert, but I w used to work for Hughes Tool Company for, it was over a year. I worked for them twice, because I had to quit once. And they hired me back a second time, because they like to hire farm boys, because they know you have a good work ethic. Um, and also, I have a college education. The industry has labeled me that I was not a farmer, et cetera, et cetera. In my farm in Hickory, I happen to be the second horizontal done in western Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, period. I was the second guinea pig. And no, I wasn't farming that farm because I bought that farm in 1990, and it was 141 acres, and the whole place was grown up and dilapidated. I've cleared 80 acres of it. I, I uh, did a pond. I redid a pond on it. It was almost three acres. Um, I did a lot of work to this place. That's all I did every day, every day, because that's my passion, and I love to work. I'm not a druggie, and I don't do booze. So, but when it comes to work, let me loose. So, and I'm not a tree hugger, as they've labeled me. Uh, I'm not a far left. You know, I'm a steward of the land, and it's common sense. I've got a lot of common sense. You know, we have to cut trees. We need wood. We need lumber. Uh, energy. One thing I want everyone here to know, this is not conventional drilling, as the industry wants you to believe. It's unconventional drilling. And people have been nothing but guinea pigs. I've been on hundreds of well sites. I've documented many, many wells from start to finish. What size casing, what size bit, what make bit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I watch these guys obliterate my farm. And a lot of people say, well, what would you sign for? You're greedy. You wanted money. Well, first of all, we didn't know they were doing horizontal drilling because they lied. They said vertical drilling. And we were going to get 300,000 cubic feet of gas free a year. I'm thinking 300,000 cubic feet of gas a year free. That's a lot of gas. Uh, something's not adding up here. And if I would have stuck to my gut, I'd have never gotten into the mess that I'm in. But everything happens for a reason, as my mom always told me. And uh, it's the same thing with, uh, as my priests have told me. God is walking me through this. And I'm educating everybody that I could possibly educate. So that you know, I got $8 and... 25 cents an acre. And the landman took 75 cents an acre. So do the math. All I wanted was free gas because I wanted to build a new house there. That was all I wanted. And I'm thinking, no problem. You know, a couple vertical wells, no big deal. I've been around them. It's not that intrusive. Well, when these boys start coming in, <laughs> And naturally, uh, the first well they did was a vertical. And by the way, they plugged it, because I'm, I'm sure it was just a test well, but they did plug it. Uh, the verticals that they did drill, um, they, they're pretty much done. They're duds. Um, and they drilled it in 05. They plugged it last fall. They went up the road over a mile. Drilled on my, or they drilled a well up there in 06, a vertical. Uh, they plugged it last fall. And we also had a methane leak. So. And supposedly there wasn't a mine in that area. So what we think happened, my neighbor who had the third horizontal done, what I truly think happened, they overhorsed the frack. I might be totally wrong. But my neighbor told me to come over to his place back in, this, I think it was summer of 06, and he said, come look at my, uh, my yard. All the grass was dead, it was big circles. I said, it's coming up through. 
what is it? I said, it's, it's probably methane, it's gas. I, you know, what else would it be? Because it's going to migrate. Well, you know, last year, uh, last fall, when they plugged the well on my, my property and on my neighbor's property, they were trying to get rid of that methane leak because finally, DEP came out with monitors, methane monitors and solar panels and set one up in the yard and they set one up at an old gas well about a thousand feet away because the gas well, it was, it was old abandoned gas well and what my neighbor did, uh, part of the casing had rusted off so he pulled it off, pulled the rest of it out of the ground and then he put a rock over top and he filled it with dirt, mowed the grass over it. A mile away when they drilled and fracked a well on another neighbor's farm, that all blew off. <laughs> the water was bubbling. So, but it wasn't until last fall that they addressed the issue. And what everyone needs to know, when methane comes out of the ground, hits the atmosphere, hits the sunlight, turns into formaldehyde. It's carcinogen. Can you smell it? No. Nope. People got it in their water wells too. But the DEP was kind enough to say, this is the, the methane detector that you need to buy. It was like 130 bucks a piece. Put one in your basement, put one on your first floor. But not the industry, which is range resources in our area. Uh, as Terry also indicated about his cattle, uh, I've gone around, there's another farmer not far from Terry, and they did vertical wells on him also, not horizontals. And he lost, he was up to about 85 to 88 head since 07, he's been losing cattle. And this year, I just stopped over there about three weeks ago to a month ago, and he told, well, his, his wife actually called me back because they weren't home, and said that they lost three cows this year and a calf. And riding up here, Terry said that he just ran into the, uh, the husband, Gary, and he said they lost uh, three cows so far and five calves. You see this, I don't know, this is quite a distance, but last spring I was at his house and I cut a, a liver out of this calf, a piece of liver. This calf lived about two days. And it has, a, the white eye. It's blind. The iris and pupil are completely white. The other eye was, uh, the right eye was blue. That's another connect the dot. So now he's up to over 90 head. And his feeders, um, they were only half the weight they normally should be at their age. So where are you getting your hamburger from, folks? Um, here's another farmer that I've shown these pictures many times. This, this fellow lost cattle. He lost uh, 21 head over three months. And uh, 17 of these cows were brood cows. So again, do the math, he lost 38 head. None of these farmers have been compensated. I found another farmer up in Clearfield, a dairy farmer. They no longer dairy. Their water well got contaminated. The DEP lied to them, and so did Penn State. Their milk production went down, dropped off by half. Where are we getting our milk from, folks? They're messing with the whole ecosystem. Uh, they also lost their dogs. And they lost 10 Holsteins, and again, no one's paid them a dime. There's story after story after story out there, and the industry has tried to cover it up, and so has DEP. And so, you know, I was with the DEP. I was on a show last fall, and our uh, retired, if you will, secretary of the DEP, John Hanger, was on that panel. And I was invited, and this is invitation only, and this is on our public broadcasting station in Pittsburgh, Channel 13. And it's a Chris Moore, it's called Experience, and Chris Moore is, uh, the, uh, runs the show pretty much. Anyway, John Hanger said on that uh, panel 
to one person, on, uh, another person on the panel, that no one has ever been, gotten sick from this. And I just, I, I was just gritting my teeth. So after it was over, I went up to him, and I, <clears throat> and I poked him in the shoulder a couple times, and I said, you know exactly what's going on. I said, you know what, I'm going to extend an invitation to you. I want you to ride with me for two days. He stood there and glared at me, and he trembles like this. So, needlessly to, needless to say, he never took me up on my offer. I will take you to people that their lives have been turned upside down, their health has been totally compromised, in so many, so, so many different ways. There are people that are having like neuropathy. There are people that have, that have benzene in their blood. We've had their blood tested, their urine tested. They've got benzene in their blood. They've got phenol in their blood. They've got arsenic in their blood. They've got um, formaldehyde in their blood, uh, toluene, uh, ethylene uh, glycols, eth uh, glycol ethers. It goes on and on. People that are living around the compressor stations. We've got some people that have left, left their homes. We've got other people that are looking to get out. So there are a whole lot of issues, and I've never been up in this area before, and it just, uh, when I worked in the oil and gas field, I did come as far as Bath to a well site and uh, to deliver some product. But... Uh, this is such a beautiful area, folks. Man, I just, I would not want to see you guys get stamped, you know, stepped on like we did. And our rivers are all compromised. I sell heavy equipment for a living, and I call on governmental, governmental uh, agencies, townships, boroughs, municipalities. And I brought light Beaver Falls water, uh, Beaver Falls Municipal Authority. I brought that to light at an EPA meeting last year. And uh, when I spoke, and a lot of people picked up on it. And the Associated Press did quite a story about right around Christmas about the Beaver River. And the reason why they've been having so many problems is because 18 miles north, they're dumping at a treatment plant. So a lot of issues, folks. And people People are being affected, like I said, every which way possible in all of our rivers, the Allegheny River, the Monongahela River, the Yakagani River, the Beaver River, they've all been compromised. And the bromide levels are extremely high, and the industry is trying to say it's the salt from our, uh, that we're dumping on the roads. Well, guess what? The bromide levels spiked back in, uh, I think it was July and August, and we don't put salt on our roads in July and August. So that kind of shot their theory down. Folks, stick together. Don't let this industry come in and divide and conquer you. It was a lot more fun to hear about your registered cattle. Uh, our next speaker is Leslie Lewis. Uh, she's an attorney from New York City. Uh, she is represented some of the people in Dimock, and she's talked to a lot of farmers and others who have uh, been affected by the gas drilling and have had, uh, had negative impacts. Um, I'm sure she's spent a lot of time listening to people and hearing their stories, trying to help them, and I'm sure this is going to be a tough st story to hear too. So, thank you. First of all, I represent clients affected by fracking, affected by drilling. I'm about to give general observations. I'm not going to talk about specific cases. Do you hear me? I may not do that. <clears throat> but having been doing this kind of work for two years now, I see similarities from county to county and state to state and it's very disturbing, okay? We are, 
the mic? Oh. Ew, I don't like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm a, a mother. I'm a nurse. I'm a trial lawyer. I generally do medical malpractice work for plaintiffs who are seriously injured. This case, the Dimock case, is how I first became introduced to fracking. And I was invited to go and meet some people such as yourselves, only they were further down the line. You know, they had signed leases. They had problems with their water. They had difficulties with the regulatory agency. They had problems with the company. We tried to work with them to work those problems out. It didn't work. There had to be a lawsuit. So that's Dimmick. That's uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania. It's been a, it's been a journey since uh, November 19, 2009. And it continues. And it's a hard fight. And if there was one thing I wanted to say to you is that understand who you're dealing with. You know, if someone approaches you for a lease, you get an attorney to look at it, OK? You limit that lease. You protect your rights. You make sure that it just doesn't roll over. You make sure that it's clear to the company what you consider to be the material terms of the lease, OK? Now, I'm going to tell you that um, when I go and when I've talked to people who are affected, and I, I and my law firm represent uh, people in Bradford County, Susquehanna County, here in Horseheads, we represent those uh, clients. We have clients in uh, Western uh, Pennsylvania. All of the clients were duped into leases. All of the clients, now, here's what I've learned is kind of sad about the situation is, and you look like a, you know, intelligent, you know, middle class group of people, okay, fairly successful. What I've, what I've found is that the industry tends to go to the areas of greatest need, to the areas where people are isolated, to the areas where people are very pro-America. They buy the line, you know, this is a gas source, this is an energy source that we need for national security, for our economic uh, security. We need that. These are people that trust authority, okay, who have had their minerals uh, extracted over the years, okay, who tend to trust and are not litigious. They don't want to sue. The other thing is they're very private. Would you consider yourselves private? You're out here because you want, you know, I live in Manhattan. I like, you know, I live in a loft building. I like running into my neighbors and people on the street. But they come to these areas where the neighbors are separated, where the neighbors don't tend to speak. So when we went into Dimmick or we go into Bradford County, you go into communities where people have water problems and they haven't talked to the next person about it. They think it's just them. They think if they make a stink or create a problem that their, um, that their royalties are somehow going to be affected. In some cases, the gas company will deliver water. They'll say, we didn't do anything wrong, but we're a good neighbor. We're going to give you a water replacement. That's a way of buying a person. That's a way of buying silence. And people actually become afraid that their water will be taken away. At any rate, um, so. You have these landmen, and this is, again, I'm speaking generally, but the pattern is identical from community to community. Landmen, from, not from your area, will come in and offer you a lot of money and the best deal possible, and you have to do it now, or your, you know, we'll take your gas anyway. All right, that's how it occurred in each and every, for each and every client that, um, that we represent. Subsequent to that, um, there is supposed to be a testing of water pre-drilling, okay? And um, if that occurs, uh, you're supposed to know after the drilling process has started or been completed whether or not the water has been affected in any way. Well, what has happened is that because the industry does not really reveal what it is they're putting into the earth, what they're testing for, and, and they just do superficial tests, you never really know 
what it is that they've put in that might be contaminating your water. They don't do the type of testing that is necessary. Now, the types of uh, relief uh, for people who have suffered injuries as a result of uh, gas drilling include, um, well, first of all, I'll say that the following types of injuries have occurred. Plaintiff's water supplies have been contaminated. Plaintiffs have been and continue to be exposed to combustible gases. There are frequently explosions that occur because the gas in the wellhead in the air becomes so great that it literally explodes the well. Plaintiff's property has been harmed and degraded and devalued. Uh, it's a very significant development. The banks, uh, the large banks, are no longer uh, loaning to owners of land who have uh, gas uh, leases on the land. Um, the properties. Uh, the plaintiffs who live on these properties have lost the use uh, and enjoyment of their property based on the activities of the drilling and, frankly, the contamination of the air and the water. Pla plaintiffs have the fear of uh, future illness, secondary to not knowing what it is they're inhaling, drinking, you know, having their children, you know, uh, you know, in, in the backyard playing. They don't know what the future will bring, okay? So these are the types of injuries that, uh, that people are claiming and that uh, end up being the substance of litigation. Now, the ultimate, ultimate problem is this um, severe emotional distress that's really akin to, um, uh, you know, a stress disorder. You know, an acute, uh, severe emotional distress, post-traumatic stress, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Gasland? All right, so I, it's a little bit preaching to the choir. You've seen it. You get the flavor of what's possible. That really is what's going on in your adjacent state. All across Pennsylvania, there are every community where drilling is occurring, these similar types of events are happening. So what is one to do, seriously? Um, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I came into this lawsuit and it wasn't to kill any industry. I'm as corporate as the next person, okay? I'm as interested in making money as the next person, but I'm also a humanist and when you're gonna do something, you do it right and you protect the resources. You protect natural resources and you protect the safety of, of, of families and the integrity of an estate. And that's, I wanted, I, I'm not doing too good a job here, but I want to comment on what to me is the most painful uh, 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 issue to, or, or scenario to observe in this situation. And that is the way that the industry goes in to generally an impoverished community, generally an isolated community, and they pit neighbor against neighbor. They they pit literally a small landowner against a large landowner. Make no mistake about it. it they are playing a class game. There, it, there's a little bit of a class warfare going on, and that's in every community. The larger, listen, those of you with large you know, um, packages of property, you could become very rich. They come in here, you will be very rich. Okay, but it's, it, it, that's fine. You're gonna have your neighbor who has a quarter of an acre, an acre, five acres, that person's gonna be contaminated and gonna remain not rich, okay? Those, those monetary dreams do not materialize for the average person. So what, it, what happens? So problems occur and then the victims become marginalized. I don't know, do any of you read the paper? Have you, do, how many of you know about Dimmick, Pennsylvania? Okay, all right, well, if I do nothing else tonight, I promised a couple of my clients I would do the following. Set the record straight. <laughs> how many of you think that the Dimmick litigation has been settled? Settled, okay. Well, here's what happened in Dimmick. We thought we were on a very positive, correct my client's water problems, okay, and, uh, and, 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 and upgrade the level of their uh, operations, okay. When the secretary, in his own words, decided they weren't doing their job, 
okay, that they were, this is the secretary, the worst gas company in Pennsylvania, okay? He reached the point, literally, where he's talking to me and my clients and it's like, you need a pipeline, right? Any of you, a pipeline? A water pipeline, I'm sorry. They need a fresh water pipeline from a, um, from a municipal source. So the secretary uh, was in favor of that. He set up the whole uh, uh, procedure where it was uh, voted on, where there would be allocation of uh, money for the pipeline from the Montrose water, uh, municipal water, to the Dimmick residents. It was supposed to be piped there. It was voted on. The clients were going to get fresh replacement water. Uh, in December, uh, the middle of December of last year, the secretary called all my clients in on the phone and said the water pipeline has been pulled. He said you're never going to get it anyway because the new secretary is going to um, uh, see to it that that pipeline is canceled. And instead, what we have for you, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, a, a, an arrangement that I've made with the gas company where we will give you cash and you can essentially move out of Dimmick with the cash, or you can stay in Dimmick and use that money to pay for your water, fresh water needs in perpetuity. And there were literally people that were offered $50,000, between 50 and $300,000, all right? No strings, the secretary says. No strings whatsoever, okay? No client accepted it. Before we were off the phone with the secretary, the gas company had already put all over the website, global settlement with the Dimmick plaintiffs. If I travel to Ohio, if I travel to West Virginia, if I travel to parts of New York, people who are, quote, in the know will say, well, Dimmick settled. You know, those people took the money and they settled. So they didn't settle, but what's significant is that when the companies come in, when they contaminate your land, Okay, when they get violations, let's say the regulatory agency does its job and they get violations, what they want you to, the, the way it works out is that either one of two things will happen. Regulatory will say, put a whole house treatment system in your house and the gas company will pay for it and be quiet, that's it. Okay, or two, they will give you money and tell you to pay for your own water or leave your residence. Do whatever you want with it. So um, this is, uh, that's something that I want to clarify for, the, for those, those of you who may or may not know about Dimmick. The, 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 rumor, the rumor is out there, it's on uh, the website of the gas company that there has been a global settlement with the first uh, case of its type in the Northeast that, uh, that frankly is, is not true. So, with respect to um, what happens if you do ever get to the point, and you're far, you're well removed from this, and hopefully it'll, it will never ever uh, be a situation that you face, but what occurs with respect to litigation subsequent to that is that you sue under certain theories of law, and in the cases brought so far, the theories are negligence, the theories are breach of contract. Now those leases that are signed, they are contracts, okay? And um, in the cases that I've been involved with so far, we sue for breach of contract in the sense that you promise to return water to pre-drilling conditions, okay? Now, that requires that you do pre-drilling tests. That also requires that you do reasonable pre-drilling tests, the tests for the components that you're putting into the earth, so that if you don't reveal what it is that you're putting down there, how can you ever possibly meet that element of the contract? Actually, we think we're going to go pretty far with that one. Also, we are, um, you know, in the cases that we've brought, we're paving the way, hopefully, for the categorization of natural gas operations as being a strict liability type of uh, situation, like dealing with dynamite. Okay, that's strict like liability. It's ultra hazardous. When you have an ultra hazardous operation, and we've already survived a motion to dismiss on this, if we can get natural gas drilling and operations to be strict liability, whenever there's an injury to your property or your water, okay, you don't have to prove 
that it was the gas company that did it. It was the gas operations that did it. You go directly to damages. So that's something to sort of be looking out for. That's a, um, an area of law that hopefully we're going to be uh, paving with some of these earlier cases in, in this area. OK. Well, I'll stop now. Uh, the red sign went up. Then uh, open to questions. I have cards. Anybody ever wants to just talk, uh, I do it all the time. Thanks. Uh, Peter Gamba will do uh, questions and answers. I can't help it. This is so down. I've got to share at least some good news. Uh, our son Peter is doing an internship in Germany on a farm that's producing alternative energy. And they're using 500 acres of corn. It's a process that makes a lot more sense than making grain into ethanol. They're taking the whole plant. That farm is selling three quarters of a megawatt of renewable electricity, which, and that's continuous, 24 seven, all year round. That's probably as much as a fairly substantial wind farm. And they're doing it out of corn and manure. And they're getting a real strong return, and the byproduct is fertilizer. All right. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. I really want to thank the, the people who spoke tonight. Um, just about everybody traveled a long distance, and Art flew back from Florida. So I'd really like everybody to give them a round of applause because they, they really worked really hard to get here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to entertain questions. We'll use that aisle. Joe will have a mic at that aisle. And I'll have a mic at this, this aisle here. So if you can just kind of line up and you can ask the, the, the uh, panelists questions. I don't know if the mics are turned on. All you've got to do is come on down here. As people go out, you may notice there are some things to sign up for. There is a newsletter uh, that is an electronic newsletter. It's free. Uh, it will respect your confidentiality. It's a quarterly. If you want to sign up for that, you're welcome to do so. Here's our first question. Uh, if you choose, identify yourself. And if you have a question specifically for a panel member, uh, please mention or point to the panel member. You can handle it, right? OK. Meryl Nowak. Um, I'm a stakeholder. I have 73 acres in the town of Jerusalem. And I'd specifically like to ask uh, Ms. Lewis who the secretary is that you're mentioning. Who's the secretary? John Hanger was the former head of the Department of Environmental Preservation in Pennsylvania. Protection, thank you. He no longer is employed by the state of Pennsylvania. The new person as the governor was uh, subsidized by the grilling industry to the tune of $700,000. OK. Let me ask a question uh, until somebody who's shy comes up here. How do you get out of your lease? How do you get out of your lease? How do you get out of a lease if, in fact, and a number of people had wanted to answer that? Uh, um, well, it's very hard to get out of a lease. It really is, um, unless there's a, um, a problem that develops. For example, um, recently, I did uh, just uh, helped a family of multiple generations of farmers, again, up in um, Susquehanna County. Um, and they have a five-year lease that would roll over. And in that area of Pennsylvania, the lease won't roll over uh, to the second five years unless there's some sort of activity within the first five. And now it's just a couple months. Uh, to go, and they've done nothing. And now they want to do the seismic testing, and these farmers called me. And in their particular instance, I said, okay, do the following. I said, you really want to get out of, out of the lease? Yeah. Uh, I said, you tell them that they have materially breached the lease. And let me, let me tell you that contract law is, if you can find a, 
what's considered a material breach. That means a breach of a promise that's so substantial, okay, to the basis for your entering the bargain, okay? So you have to have, you know, a lawyer that parses through and looks at it. But in this farmer's instance, and I, I'm just telling you this one example recently, I was able to say to them, okay, your lease, like all the other leases in the area, says that, you, that the company is to restore the water to pre-drilling conditions, okay? I say that that uh, consent, uh, a consent order that Cabot entered with, that's a gas company, entered with, um, the DEP in December of 2010, where they basically said, here, take the money. Just take the money. No pipeline, just take the money. They abrogated, they, they basically capitulated and, and, and basically it indicated that they cannot restore the water to pre-drilling conditions. Okay, so that, that was something that they could look forward to. The trick is, seriously, to have a, enter a contract only at arm's length. I mean, these gentlemen and, and, and Ellen here are basically telling you don't do it, okay? But if you feel that you must, okay, you have to get the best possible representation you can. And there is somebody, I'm not going to sort of broadcast it right now, but there is somebody that I can seriously think of that would be the first person that I would go to that's not too far from where you people live that you might, might want to consider talking to, and I'd be glad to pass on her name. But after the fact, I mean, you know, before there's really any problem, it's very difficult. It's like once you enter it, you've got to have some kind of breach of the contract. And, it, you know, your right to, you know, unconscionability is something where if you were, you just felt like you were under extraordinary pressure. Like literally, if you don't sign now, I'm going to take your firstborn. You know, something, something really outrageous where you felt like if I don't do it, I, you know, I'm going to really be in trouble. Then you can, uh, you can break a lease for that kind of thing. But uh, the best thing is to speak, you know, enter a lease uh, with the consultation of an attorney. You must not ever do it on your own because you, it's really hard to get out. I'd like to As Ellen add indicated. a little bit because a group of us at Fleece want to get out of our leases. And we worked with an attorney to look at whether we thought there were grounds to void leases. And it's pretty much as Leslie said. Um, if you were a blind little old lady and the landman came and pressured you, maybe you could get out of your lease. But if you were a reasonably intelligent person who actually changed some of the clauses in the lease, it would not be seen that you were so weak that it was unconscionable that they acted that way. And frankly, they write the leases in such generalities that, I mean, we did consult an attorney, but he was not knowledgeable enough three years ago. Um, so one of the things Fleece is trying to do is put on our website a list of attorneys who we think might be worth looking at. Another thing is, um, have you all heard of force measure? Does that mean something to you? So the gas companies have been sending letters to people with leases saying, because the governor put this executive order that is a moratorium of sorts on horizontal hydrofracking, we get to extend the leases because we couldn't drill during that time. So, you know, you thought the term was going to be up at such and such a date, but no, because of this moratorium. Um, on the fleeced website is something that basically challenges that. If anybody you know gets such a letter, tell them to write to the gas company, and the, the fleeced website has information about how that letter should read. You must contest it, because uh, apparently if silence is assumed to be acquiescence. So you need to say no, and the basic reason that you can say no is they could still do a, a regular well, they're not precluded from getting minerals from your land. Just the way your lease doesn't say horizontal hydrofracking, it doesn't say horizontal hydrofracking. So uh, one thing then is to contest that. The other thing that is unbelievable is even if your lease terminates, let's say they don't come to my property, they don't try to put a road, and so I actually hit a date of termination. They're supposed to, within 30 days, file something in the county clerk's office, a notice of termination. If they don't, 
and you want to clear your record and go on record, you have to find out who now owns your lease. And frankly, they sell them all, just like the mortgage deals where they kept mm -hmm. selling them off. So the guy who you leased with, the company, is not necessarily who has your lease now. Uh, you should be able to find it by going to the county clerk's office. And then you have to do certified notification to all of the parties that own your lease, and maybe it's been divided up, and maybe six companies now own your lease, and tell them that you think it's terminated, and if you don't hear from them in 30 days, then it is terminated. But it's appalling that the burden is really on you. There's also a packet of that on the leased website. Peter, if I might, one other option that you could consider is work with uh, your county legislators, several of whom are here tonight, your town boards, and support their desire for bans, moratoriums, work with them so that if, in fact, your municipality does not allow hydrofracking in the first place, then your lease cannot be activated. Mm -hmm. So up front, you do not regulate an abomin abomination, you prevent it. Okay, before I go to the next questions, people have been asking for your business cards. Oh, yippee. So if you have a bunch, bring them on down and then we'll pass them out. Our, our webmaster, Bob Davis, is here tonight and perhaps we can put your contact information on our website and then we can have you just get to that website and it'll be right there. And it is a committee to preserve the Finger Lakes and uh, get a hold of a computer and check it and we will have that on, Bob. Thank you. Okay. No one is. Next question. Here we go. Thank you, hi, my name is Maura and I'm from Tioga County. Um, which is another poor rural county in the southern tier. Uh, and I happen to be writing a book about fracking. Full, full disclosure. <laughs> uh, about which I've been working on for quite a long time. Um, one thing that wasn't brought up today, and it's much on our minds right now, is the uh, uh, disaster continues to unfold in Japan. Yes. Is the, uh, well, several things. First of all, there is a lot of naturally occurring radioactive material that's brought up in the fracking process, um, which is very troublesome. But also the fact that this uh, disaster may possibly put a little bit of a halt on the growth in nuclear uh, energy that's been pushed here in the United States. I'm not sure it really will because uh, the disaster in the Gulf of Mexico hasn't put a halt to the offshore drilling or onshore drilling for oil but um, it's just something to think about. Wanted to bring that up. I've had the good fortune or the mi misfortune on, uh, to visit both Terry Greenwood's farm and Ron Gula's farms. And one of the many heartbreaking things I witnessed there was the, the crisscrossing of the farms with roads, making all of the fields completely unusable. And I was wondering if you could both talk about that and also Terry about uh, the home that your son had hoped to build on a portion of your land? Yeah. Uh, oh. Yes. Uh, when they came on the property, I told my son, he, well, he got married. Now he bought a house someplace else. I told him I'd give him a half acre down in the bottom of Hayfield. And I told the gas company, I said, that's his piece of property. He didn't care. That's where they put the gas well at. It was coming up the driveway. He was going to put a house trailer there. We was going to run our water line down to his house, and he was going to put a sand mound in, which cost $10,000, because he would hit at about $15,000 in the whole place, you know, at the most. Yeah. So that's, that's some of the things they do to you. They don't care what, who they tramp on or what, you know. They like, like she said, all, and the road's all over the property. Through the agriculture department, when I went out to sign up every year, I lost six acres of property off of the agriculture department for funding. That's like if you have a drought, they help you out. You know, if your hay sh fields are short, they'll help you sow them. They give you so much money every year in that, you know. Is that, is that okay? Is that good? Okay. <laughs> Did you want more? Uh, yeah, as uh, far as what Mara said, once the roads come in, like the fields that I cleared, I was getting prepared to lay contour strips out. And I also, when I did farm uh, full time, uh, I did promote my cattle as organically grown. And as I told Mara, I wanted to 
uh, go back to that again. And I also wanted to put in a five acre peach orchard. I did start a small orchard of 30 some trees. Um, but you know, my dreams, everything went right up in smoke. And uh, they do, the lies are unbelievable. They insult you so bad that, I mean, there are days that, I mean, I want to get physical. I do. And they know it. But that, because that's, they push you to that point. That, you know, it's an invasion of your privacy. They're destroying your human rights. And they act like they could walk on water. And they can't. And I'm going to tell you one more thing that you need to know. Um, when I went to get a loan to secure uh, my lawsuit against Range Resources, the bank who I ba banked with since a kid, I spoke to the commercial loan officer there over the phone. And he said, Ron, I have driven through Washington County and Greene County. I've seen the roads. I've seen the pipelines. I've seen the tanks. This is all new to the banking industry. We don't know how it's going to work. He also said, Ron, I'm going to compare this to the Obama stimulus package. It's all new. We don't know how it's going to work. He said, it doesn't matter how many wells are on your property, it's a commodity. It goes up and down with the market, so we can't put a value to it. And if we have your property appraised, your farm, for round numbers, may have been worth $500,000, but once it's appraised, it might be worth two hundred. dollars And in closing, Ron, we don't want it. I said, well, Lonnie, let me tell you this. Factor this into your equation. I said, my property is contaminated. All these properties are contaminated. The flow pits are covered up and buried. And what do you think is in those flow pits? Well, I don't know, he said. I said, well, do some homework. And then I told him about all the exemptions because everything reverts back to the exemptions. The clean air, the clean water, the safe drinking water, the right to know, and a Superfund Act. Superfund Act is hazardous cleanup. So if it's a benign process, why in God's green earth would you have to have these exemptions in place? So folks, uh, there's so much to this and they've been doing this for years and they sat behind closed doors and figured it out. And once you sign that lease, they got you. Next question. I'm Rufka Davis. I have a farm in Starkey. Uh, I'm also on the Starkey Planning Board, and I had, do have a question, but first I need to make a comment to something you just said. Uh, your local municipality is almost certainly forbidden by the state of New York from, on its own, prohibiting hydrofracking. Uh, the municipalities may have some control over road use, uh, but if you want to actually have hydrofracking as such prohibited, uh, you have to go to higher levels. This is not to say it's not useful, whoop, no, uh, not useful to be, uh, to work with your local towns and villages and counties. It's highly useful to try to work to, but uh, please don't ask us to do things that we can't do. Uh, the question I have, I hear a great deal about noise uh, in relation to the hydrofracking process, and I don't, I, I hear a lot about it, I'm very concerned about it, but I also don't generally see any sort of clear specifics, and I was wondering if there's anybody here tonight who has such a thing as a figure in decibels at given distances from the wellhead, and preferably a site where I can refer to uh, the information. I, I can't answer that. Uh, they drilled four wells on my property. So I lived, through, I, I lived through four wells, two horizontals, two verticals, and four flares. Uh, it's been analogized to a jet engine. It's, uh, it's been analogized to jet engine level noise, but your question about quantification and decibels is an excellent one. I mean, I don't have it. That information's got to be out there somewhere. Somebody must have stood with a decibel meter on the edge of one of these properties and gotten readings. 
Why don't you suggest that? Hey, I, live, I live in a stone farmhouse, and we're about 2,500 feet from one down over a hill, and they're drawing a big one, and they lit it on the back side of our place. We got an old stone farmhouse, and with the TV on, you can hear that thing burning off, and it sounds like a jet plane coming across the top of the hill, and it's 2,500 feet to the back of our property on our farm, and it's up over the top of the hill and back at the back, and we got a big old stone farmhouse with window ledges this, that deep in it, and you can hear it with the TV on. So if you're close to it and you got a newer style house, a house that's not going, so it's going to sound like a jet airplane coming through your house, you know. And this, this, I, they said a couple of weeks it's supposed to do that. And then the fumes are nasty. It smells like somebody burning the material off of a car or rubbish. That's what it smells like, you know. And that's 24 hours a day. And from the road, when they lit it, they called the fire department. And what the fire department says, well, don't worry about it. It was on the news media down home. They says, don't worry about it. It's just a gas well burning off for two weeks, you know. And I guess if somebody's house burns down, they don't care, you know. That's that's what they think about it. You know? He is the it was human on the news media. The human decibel re meeting right there. Yeah. I wanted to just a point of point of right. clarification, if I might. When our colleague from the town board, Ruth, town planning board, uh, made the comment about the inability of townships to take a stand. To, uh, there are a couple of things. Just, 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 just if I might. The correction of that is that the local municipalities have the right to legislate in for the health, welfare, and safety of their residents. Sounds to me like this is appropriate. Another thing is that zoning law now is being developed that essentially says if you, in your municipalities, designate areas where there are zoned industrial, zoned agricultural, zoned whatever, you can establish that as a point of law. We work with uh, attorneys who are down in the Ithaca area. Right now there is something called the FRU decision. The FRU decision essentially says that municipalities have the right not to regulate drilling but to exact locations where this can occur. And this is where your zoning boards, your planning boards, and what have you can make a positive statement. And in the town of Jerusalem, which recently adopted a moratorium to give us a year plus to study the upcoming report, I'm sure that we will do that kind of analysis that will result in the health, welfare, and safety of the citizens of the township being protected. I have a rhetorical question for this audience. Um, I, I see it from a little different uh, perspective. I see it as kind of Wall Street against Main Street. Um, if you think you're going to win against Wall Street, good luck. Um, we have, we've, we've seen what's going on in Japan, we see what's going on with nuclear power. I'm not saying that tiny scale nuclear power, if it was looked at, maybe... The panel question, that's the question. Yeah, but I, okay, well then I'll, I'll address the panel too, the people that have experienced this, but this is for everybody, I think. Um, we have a U.S. Senator who in 2008, and you can check this on the web, uh, basically said that uh, they were in favor of safe nuclear power. For the United States. Um, we also have had the same U.S. Senator has said uh, that they were for safe hydrofracking. Okay, safe hydrofracking. Um, I don't think personally that anything is going to be accomplished, um, and especially this is addressed to the, to the attorney on the panel, I don't think anything is going to be ad addressed permanently to bar or to ban hydrofracking other than on a federal level. Um, and I'll, for full disclosure, I am running for U.S. Senate. Um, and I am a Democrat. But I'm just basic, my name is Scott Noren, I'm an oral surgeon from Ithaca, New York. Um, I basically think that it, there needs to be a federal, my, my, my question is, I personally think there should be a federal ban on fracking, period. And my, my question is to the panel, do you agree or disagree? I think it's. I think there is a line drawn in the sand. So I'm asking you to step on one side or the other. Or the other side. Um, 
You're absolutely right. There has to be, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're in a, uh, we're between a rock and a hard place now, but there is no way in the world that people should stop now and hope, we can't all, we're not all oral surgeons, we can't all run for the U.S. Senate, okay? Number one, people have to come together. Listen, keep the industry out as best you can, but people are, the, they're in charge of their own destiny, you know? Different people may want different things. To say that, by the way, hydrofracking can never be done uh, non-negligently is, is not for us to know. So far, we're getting some bad information, you know, we're getting some bad results. All right? But in the meanwhile, people must stand up for the rights. And mass litigation, okay, is costly. And we almost, in one instance, well, you know, we had a shining moment there, and the industry did succeed in bringing it down. But understand this, if you have a group of people who have been contaminated, and, they, and, the, and, and the DEP says to them, you know what, the way we're going to let the company off the hook is, you're going to have, we are uh, ordering that whole house treatment units be put into each home, and that's it, because it'll just vent the methane and everything will be cool. Now, imagine that. Is that the way you want your entire state to go? That as soon as there's methane in the water, you get basically a chemistry lab in your basement? No, the people came together and they said, that's not it. We either want a new, we have a contract here that says you got to bring it back to pre-drilling conditions. You do that. Okay, either by drilling us new wells or getting us a municipal water supply. Okay, that cost a lot of money. And as soon as that possibility occurs, that's when you will see the industry backing down. They can't keep financing. I mean, they can only keep the blanket on the problems so long. This kind of streaming of these kind of events, people are talking about what's happening. I still believe that we as people can come together and make a difference. I'm a kid of the 60s, okay? So don't, it isn't about senators, because that will be, for, that will be forever. 427 people came here tonight, and they represent a voice. Hi. Uh, thank you all for coming the distance that you came to be here. Uh, my name is Dave Walzak, and I'm from Bath, New York, and uh, also a member of CPNY. But Coalition to Protect New York, I'm sorry. These anacronyms will drive you crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, following this issue, uh, I believe there's about 33 states within our union that have been drilled. And every one of these states has some type of regulatory process. And for those people who think that New York State is going to be substantially different and be able to regulate this, and I remember John Hanger on national radio saying, yeah, there is a question, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm wondering if this, if this is ever going to be able to be regulated in your opinion. And I guess just take pot shot at this. It's a big question. Thank you. Do you want a short answer? No. And the reason I say that is, one, because of the density of wells that are going to have to be developed, as I said, the community impacts are going to be horrendous, no matter what. Whether they find a way to recycle the water doesn't stop the leaks and spills problem. Whether the um, Can they stop the leaks of methane? I presume they could if they did a much better job of it. But I basically don't believe that this industry is going to be able to come under appropriate regulation. One of the things we haven't mentioned at all is cement casing. So any well that's drilled, the idea is you isolate it from the aquifers above. You isolate it by drilling and putting a, a casing of steel and cement should keep what's in the bottom of your well isolated so it can't get into the aquifers. Cement does not last forever. Tony and Grafia, yeah, I don't know if any of you heard him, a professor at Cornell who studies this stuff, says about, a, I think it was about a third of them fail before they ever finish the well, and 60%, I think, fail over the next however many years, 
And the reality is these casings have to last pretty much forever because while some of the water comes back, a lot of the water that's pumped down there doesn't come back, stays down in the formation and is under some pressure. That's what brings the gas up is pressure. So the reality is these casings will fail. When I asked a Schlumberger guy who came and gave a seminar at Cornell, what's it going to be in 100 years? He said, gee, we don't know. Could I add just a quick comment? Even if they could drill it safely without it ruining anybody's waters, they have still turned your farm into an industrial zone. You can never reclaim that and continue to farm it in, in anybody's reasonable lifetime. So this, is, this area is a, a food production area. It is a beautiful area with clean water and fertile land. We need to preserve it to produce food because we're going to need it within another generation. Excellent. There was a, a, my name's Jack Ossent. Uh, I come from Yates County. I grew up on a dairy farm, uh, 400 acres. Um, my question is um, I, uh, hopefully more positive, and, and I was approached in the hallway out here by a couple people who says, you know, I come to all these meetings, and I leave these meetings, and I really don't know uh, considering the power of what we're facing, what we can do individually in community. So my question to the panel is, I heard about the policing power of townships. Uh, uh, I heard about uh, how laws like that could be passed. What can citizens do to encourage the townships to pass those laws to directly challenge the authority of these corporations to come in here and do this to us? I know in Tompkins County, town by town, uh, people are going door to door. And they're going door to door with a very simple, should you know, the town ban hydrofracking and getting a phenomenal response. And then the idea is obviously that you would present that to your town board so they would pass something. The other thing is to make sure that candidates run for town board who share your points of view. Yeah, I wanted to say something. You got to all stick together and keep them away from your water. If you don't have no water, <laughs> if you don't have no water, what are you going to do? The gas don't mean nothing. You know, water's more important than any of the gas. You know, you can you, you can live with water. Yeah, you can live with water. Yeah, that gas, forget about it. Yeah, yeah. But I got to farm 60 acres, temporary water supply. They got out in the country. All the water supplies, the springs, the wells, they're gone anymore. They're never coming back, you know. But they want to drill out in the country. Western Pennsylvania had a lot of good water supplies. You know. You've got the best one up here. You, know. you don't want them near that water. You know. They say, oh, they won't hurt it. But if they spill somebody, it gets in there. It killed my cattle. And there's other people that killed their cattle. There's been horses dying. There's been a lot of animals died. The animals died. You know. It'll be the people next. So you've got to keep them away from this water. You know. So the money don't mean nothing. I'll tell you what I make a month, $400 a month on, on two wells on my property and another well. I pay $100 a month for drinking water. You know, what's $300? $300 ain't nothing. You know, I retired at 60, I'm 63 now, and this is what I got to put up with. You know, they don't care what they do to you. They'll tramp all over you. you know, just keep them out of this state. You, know, you can be the first state in this you know, Keep them away. One thing, I, I would, one thing you have to do, excuse me, one thing you have to do, folks, you've got to band together, and you've got to get out there, and you've got to keep talking about it. You've got to keep educating. You've got to keep showing gas land. Some of those people on gas land I've been in touch with for several years. Josh Fox and I, uh, Josh knows me quite well. When Josh came to Pittsburgh last year and we showed um, gas land for the first time at the Bayam Theater in Pittsburgh, we had approximately 1,200 people. And afterwards, uh, and, and it went over very well. And of course, we had industry there. We had a number of the industry people, some that I picked out real quick. And uh, anyway, but that, that, that happens. Um, you stick to the facts, and that's what we did. But uh, after, the, after the show, uh, Josh came over to me, and he, he said, I want to thank you. And I said, thank, thank me for what? He said, you know, you're the one 
that inspired me to do this. I said, you have no idea, Josh, how bad I wanted to do it. I said, because not only was I burnt and I saw what was happening and I saw the toxic chemicals coming on my property and when I asked the questions and they said it was biodegradable, when you see the skull on a crossbones and it says poison on it, duh. And I told the guys, drink it. If that stuff is biodegradable, I want you to take a glass of it and drink it. No, they wouldn't do that. But anyway, the point I'm making here, Gasland, they, the industry tried to debunk it. Uh, of course, DamascusCitizens.org, I'm sure you folks know about Damascus Citizens. That's a great website. I've worked with Barbara Arendelle, one of the, you know, one of the innovators of it uh, for years, several years already now. And uh, I've been on panels with her and also with Dr. Theo Colborn. What's happening is real folks, and this is a war. And I'm gonna tell you right now, you better stand up and fight. Damascus Citizens, all one word, dot org. We have a comment from the audience. It's a town in Pennsylvania, Damascus, PA. And like I, I said, it's a very informative, uh, sorry, it's very informative. I'd like to address a question to Mr. Martins, please. Would you keep us very well informed as to the uh, experimental work uh, in, in getting energy from the corn that you made reference to? I would suggest that a good article in every paper letting, we need lifelines to grab to. This would dissipate if we had some great other hopes for getting our energy solution. Actually, that project is being repeated all over Germany, and it goes back to when people were protesting against building of nuclear plants. Because the, the problem is not just what we don't do, it's what we do instead. And what I've learned, we visited there last year, they have such strong conservation laws that part of the zoning ordinance is they check whether your house is up to standard with an infrared scanner. And when the Russians turned off the gas, Germany didn't get cold because the houses were so well insulated, it took next to nothing to keep them warm. And this uh, energy project, our utilities would fight it tooth and nail because when the, the man built this thing, the farmer spent over $7 million but he is guaranteed a return on that that will pay the bank back. And you take that particular project and multiply it by thousands, and they've replaced the energy that a giant nuclear plant would have made, only they've done it in a dispersed way all over the country. And they don't need the giant power lines because it's dispersed power. And just following up on that, you drive through a, a southern German village, and you see those beautiful red tile roofs. The whole villages that have solar panels, solar collectors on top of them, so they're getting all their, they preserve the beauty of their homes, and this is, again, dispersed, decentralized power, no power lines, the energy's all right there. Even a friend of mine in Canton, New York, where I went to school, Canton, New York, you know where that is? Cold country. Uh, he, he and his wife put one whole roof of solar paneling on. They put energy back into the grid. This is in Canton, New York. If they can do it, more of us can do it, more of the alternative energy sources. Thank you. Yes, uh, Bob McDonough, Jerusalem Township. Uh, we will not sign a lease, I know that, but I still want to test our water, and since the gas companies don't do it right, how can we do it right? Where can we go? Um, there is a, a group in uh, the Ithaca area and I'm blocking on its name. Mr. Austin, do you know that one? Do you know? I do, if you want to talk to me afterward, I'll, I'll get you contact. Steve Penningroth is if, the guy who runs if, it. And if everybody wants to know. Citizen Water Network or something like that, and they have recommendations for what to test for. One of, and they one do of, tests. One of the recommended pieces that environmental groups are saying is that if you have a well, if you can spend some money, test the waters now, get the findings of that, you have it fixed. If a neighbor has a well, even a vertical well, and there suddenly is a change in the composition of that water content, you'll know it. So uh, if you have a well, 
and people around you have leases, it may behoove you to do a little testing up front. And, and I, I don't, I, let me go. I don't have the, the name of the person with me, but if you leave me your name, I could, I could, I, I could look up Community Science Institute in Ithaca, right? There you go. And, that, and that's sticking together, and that's the kind of information we need. And I know myself and other people around here have had their water tested by that group to deal with any kind of chemicals that might come in. They said it costs four hundred and eighty-eight dollars. For those of you who didn't hear that. Oh, no, whoa, whoa, whoa! Well, no, I could tell you right now, it's going to cost a whole lot more to get to get those tests done properly. You're you're talking well over a thousand bucks, well over. Because there are a number of things to test for. So my name is Winnie. I live in Wheeler, over in Stabenne County, over the hill, and. Um, I moved to this area over 15 years ago, and I heard that in Allegheny County, which um, for those of you who don't know Allegheny County, it has um, more deer than people, they went there to try and put a nuclear waste dump. And they fought it, and they won. So, you know, if that's possible against the nuclear industry, which is definitely big business, I think we'd all agree. Um, I think it's possible for us to band together. So my question is, do we have any examples of civil disobedience that any, anyone knows of, Pennsylvania or other states where people have come together? Because, of course, we have a rich history dating back to the Boston Tea Party and, and Henry David Thoreau and Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement and so forth of doing civil disobedience when legal recourse fails. It sounds like what Ellen said is, you know, it's really hard to get out of these leases. So Ellen. If they come to drill on your land, put the word out, and we'll come lay down around your property, and they'll have to drive over us, OK? That's right. That's right. That's what to do. That's, that's what needs to happen. Hey, you can have a big party there, and have a whole bunch of people that ain't going to take you all to jail. <laughs> One, I should mention that in 1978 and 1979, the Department of Energy wanted to put a nuclear waste repository up the hill from us on Italy Hill. And we, a bunch of citizens came together. They thought we were pretty naive, just like the gas people did. And we came together and gathered a lot of information. We had some forums in a, in a place just like this. And we basically told them no way did we want to be their guinea pigs because there was no insurance coverage for it just like that, just a little bit of puff of radiation in our farms would be worthless. And, and we felt it would be foolish to put it in a farming area. And we kind of blew them out of the water. They picked up their, their pursuits and went home. And they still haven't solved that problem, even with Yucca Valley and all the other places. In, in um, New Mexico, they had tried it. And, uh, and, and I believe West Valley became a waste reprocessing facility. And they're spending about a billion dollars a year and a half for the last 20 years trying to clean that up, and along with many other places. To, to address your question to... just a little bit, we have a listing out front on one of the panel boards of the bans, moratoria, and statements from, say, Cooperstown Chamber of Commerce, Bassett Hospital. That's all listed for you if you would like to leave your emails. I can send that to you. It's a listing of all the places with bans and moratoria, which implies a collaborative action that produced results, and I'd be happy to get that to you. Joe, it's your, your, why don't we just take three more questions? Because I think three we have more three more here. questioners. Oh, four more questions, and then, and then we'll call it a night. Well, let her go ahead of me. Give it to her. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm from Alfred, New York. Virginia Rasmussen is my name. And I guess I would like to just speak very, very briefly to two points in general uh, relative to resistance and civil disobedience. I think one of the best ways to be civilly disobedient in this regard is to pass this kind of ban. 
you're right. Corporations in this country now, though given no rights in our Constitution, have far more rights than we do. They are governing us. They should, in fact, be subordinate to us. We are the self-governing citizens. We are the we, not them. So it's true. Uh, this is a comment. It's a comment, but I think it's an important one. The, the corporations will say you can't ban you can't ban our activities here you don't have the rights to do that but you know if if a hundred communities in this state if a thousand communities on the east coast if ten thousand communities in this country do that kind of thing this is what changes law law changes by challenging existing law so i support our doing those bans and in fact i support our writing laws in our jurisdictions that ban corporations from having any constitutional rights. And my last comment is, just so all of you know, there is a movement in this country to do that. It's called Move to Amend. It's an amendment movement. It's growing among the citizens. It's well organized. Check it out on your websites. Move to Amend, one word, dot org. It's an effort to pass an amendment, ultimately, to the Constitution that takes away from, corp from corporations those constitutional rights. Bans in our communities will lead to that effort, and it's the only thing that's going to keep us around this earth. Thank you. Um, my name is Francis O'Hara. I live in Poultney, right near beautiful downtown Poultney. So my point, a couple of points, uh, um, I want to express my gratitude to the panel and also to the group uh, hope, committee to preserve the Finger Lakes for, for calling us together. Two points, one is I understand uh, that this might be broadcast live on, worldwide on the internet. And if it is, if it has been broadcast and recorded, I hope we get it on the website so I can share this with some of my friends who couldn't be here tonight. Um, that being said, um, I'm nervous. I'm not a public speaker. Um, no, I'm right here. Uh, um, gratitude. Um, oh, yeah. Um, last year, um, I live not that far from the Bergstresser Well. Some of you know about the Bergstresser Well if you're around Pulteney. And, and some of us are going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step. I'm taking a step. I'm going to Albany. I'm going to Albany with some friends on, on April 11th. And I, I just got permission from, a, I think it's Mary Beth, to put a, we, we have room on the bus on the 11th, and there's a sign-up sheet out there at, on the committee to, committee to Preserve the Finger Lakes table. And, and uh, uh, so if you want to get on the bus, uh, I'll take the information and give it to Sue Malter, and we'll get you on the bus. We're going to keep learning. Um, so that's how it goes. So I'm, I'm grateful to my neighbors up there on the panel uh, and, and, uh, and for my continuing education on this very, very important issue. There you go. Hi. You all get to go home, Ann. I'll be quick. So um, I moved away from Penyan in 03 to go to Arizona, and I'm visiting here a couple times a year, and I hope to come back and buy some farmland. So I would like to know where we can find a map to find out where all these people already signed these leases. And can we get a list of the people who didn't? And what about if everybody wants to write handwritten notes to those people? Could we do that? And the other thing I have to say is there were 427 people here. Before I left for Arizona, there was a meeting about hogs and they were worried about the smell in Penyon, and there were 500 people there, and it was at the academy. So let's have another one with even more people. In terms of the map question, and do you know who signed? So the town county clerk's office will have a record of every leased property. In Tompkins County, and I believe in a number of the Finger Lakes County, and I'm not sure whether Yates is included, um, an environmental organization has gone to that trouble of making a map. 
that shows leased properties. So it may be online on the website. If they haven't done it, then nobody's done it. And you can only do it one by one. You could identify, they're identified by tax parcel. And <coughs> depending on your county, the tax parcel may be linked to a database with people's names and addresses. You can, uh, tax parcel information can yield the name and contact information but whether it's computerized or whether you actually have to go to the town hall, town clerk's office and go one by one, I don't know. The Freedom of Information Law uh, gives you access to that as a taxpayer in a township. Town of Jerusalem has it posted on the wall and you can access that information in any of your town municipalities. I believe it was done in Yates County about a year ago, but of course it quickly gets out of date. It needs to be up updated. Uh, frequently. One more question. Good evening, and thank you for, for sharing you, um, your experiences. Uh, my name is Faye Ugakis. I live in Ithaca, New York, a concerned citizen, active citizen. Uh, I'm going to make a quick announcement, a comment, and a question. One, there's a poster in the back about a conference that's happening at the end of the month at Cornell University on hydrofracking. It's three days, the end of March, uh, April 1st, April 2nd. Um, the, the, other, the second thing is, is a quick comment, if I may. Uh, the woman that talked about banning. Uh, I've been saying this for a long time in Ithaca. Some people who appreciate it, some people who don't. Pittsburgh has banned fracking. Buffalo now has banned fracking. It is in the works in Ithaca, New York. It's still pending, but hopefully it'll get out there. It is very powerful for everybody to ban. It, it, it does, whether you think it does it or not, there, there is a symbolism, and symbolism sometimes is very important. What we all stand for something, because what they want is for us to be powerless. And, and the woman was right. They seek out people that feel unempowered, okay? So that's, that's what we need to do. We need to stand together. And the lawyer is correct. The, the, the lawyer is very correct in, in what she said. You know, we have to have that faith. We have to believe we can do it. And I believe we can do it. And one, one other part to my comment is, I have to say this, on 60 Minutes this week, when I saw that interview on 60 Minutes, when this curly guy, curl, curveball, finally admits he lied, you know, about the war in Iraq. This information was taken by our government, never interviewing this person, and committing us to an endless war with all our money going down the drain, and people dying. What's your question? So, the, so ba basically with that comment I was trying to say, we are being lied to, and it's time for us to say, no more, no more. We have to take back our lives, because that affects us right here with the hydro fact, because somebody lied about energy back then. So the last question is, what are we, I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> what are we doing in terms of unification? Like one of the reasons why I wanted to come here tonight was I wanted to see what the farmers are doing. How many farmers are coming together? How many vineyard, uh, vine people are coming together? I mean, are you unified? Are you talking amongst each other? Because we need to be unified. That's the only way it's going to happen. And we can stop hydrofracking. The ground, the ground is swelling. Um, it, this has come a long way since last year this time. And you, are you aware that New Jersey, the state of New Jersey put a ban on it, the state? They have set, they have set precedents. Philadelphia, New Jersey. Yes. There are 17 municipalities in New York State. That's okay. Anyone it's who banned. wants a it's listing, banned. it's up there on the board, we'll We're get it to everything. you. Now also, uh, I just, uh, last week I was in uh, Canton, Ohio. They're, they're trying to get a ban there. Of course, their governor wants it. Their new governor is all for it. Um, two weeks, or a week prior to that, I was in uh, Maryland. I was down there, and I spoke in front of the uh, Maryland legislature. So if we could get all four corners working, they're going to put a squeeze on PA, hopefully. Uh. <laughs> no, no, the gas, this is very important. I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's what this is all about. 
And in Maryland, when I was there, the industry was there. A lot of people from the industry, including the Marcellus Shell Coalition. Okay. And uh, the, the one individual did uh, uh, admit that they were getting the ports ready here in Jersey to export the liquids. I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Those of you who stayed and those of you who have left, I really appreciate it. I want to thank the, the, the panelists again. This is a very, 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 very good gathering of people. You need to know yeah, the Committee to Preserve the Finger Lakes. Of you know, one of our missions is tell our friends, tell our family, tell our neighbors. When you go in a restaurant, tell, tell the waitress, tell the wait, waiter. If a police option gives you a ticket, tell the policeman. Just let everybody know that this is an issue. And thank you again for coming. Let's be careful, let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost could be forever. Let's be careful what we do. To our land of flowing waters, to our land of fabled lakes, comes an outfit known as Drillcon, which has never made mistakes. For the gas that lies below us, they intend to hydrofrack. They will push, we don't know what, down and stick us with what comes back. Let's be careful, let's be careful, let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost couldn't be forever, let's be careful. Marcellus, oh Marcellus, oh our deep Marcellus shale. If they squeeze you into pieces, will we live to weep and wail? Oh clean water, oh clean water, oh clean water pure and fine. Are you lost and gone forever? Oh clean water pure and fine. Let's be careful, let's be careful. Let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost couldn't be forever. Let's be careful what we do. Their trucks chew up our roadways, gas and poison taint our wells. If the salt pollutes our farmland, we'll have energy from hell. Can we trust them? Can we trust them? Can we take their word alone? Shall we leave it to their judgment or use judgment of our own? Oh, clean water, oh, clean water, Oh, clean water, pure and fine. Are you lost and gone forever? Oh, clean water, pure and fine. Let's be careful, let's be careful, let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost couldn't be forever. Let's be careful what we do. Oh, the cost could be forever. Let's be careful what we do. Oh, 